Hello, good morning. How's it going, everybody? We are here at the final part of, um, cut this up just a little bit. We are here at the final part of book 12 of uh, the series Unfortunate Events. Um, after this, we only have one book left before the entire series is complete. Um,. I've been having a lot of fun with it, and I'm glad to see how well it's been received, um, not just here on Twitch, but on YouTube as well, so that's always really exciting for me. This song seems a little loud. Cut it just a smidge down. Um, well, uh, without further ado, I'm just going to jump right on in. Oh, let me... Just respond real quick to this text. Okay. We are going to do the last three chapters, 11, 12, and 13. Then I will read the preview for the next book, and we'll be done. Look at how weird this is. Hi, gotta get ready to go. Okay, be safe going. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> I appreciate you. All right. Chapter 11. An old expression, used even before the schism, says that people should not see the creation of laws or sausages. This makes sense as the creation of sausages involves taking various parts of various animals and shaping them until they are presentable at breakfast and the creation of laws involves taking various parts of different ideas and shaping them until they are presentable at breakfast. And most people prefer to spend their breakfasts eating food and reading the newspaper without being exposed to creation of any sort whatsoever. The High Court, like most courts, was not involved in the creation of laws, but it was involved in the interpretation of laws, which is as perplexing and unfathomable as their creation. And like the interpretation of sausages is something that should also not be seen. If you were to put this book down and travel to the pond that now reflects nothing but a few burnt scraps of wood and the empty skies, and if you were to find the hidden passageway that leads to the underwater catalog that has remained secret and safe for all these years, you could read an account of an interpretation of sausages that went horribly wrong and led to the destruction of a very important bath escape. All because I mistakenly thought the sausages were arranged in the shape of a K when actually the waiter had been trying to make an R and an account of an inter interpretation of the law that went horribly wrong although it would hardly be worth the trip, as that account is also contained in the remaining chapters of this book. But if you were at all sensible, you would shield your eyes from such interpretations, as they are too dreadful to read. As Violet, Klaus, and Sunny caught a few winks, a phrase which here means slept fitfully in the closet-sized room 121, arrangements were made for the trial, during which the three judges of the High Court would interpret the laws and decide on the nobility and treachery of Count Olaf and the Baudelaire's, but the children were surprised to learn, when a sharp knock on the door awakened them, that they would not see this interpretation themselves. "'Here are your blindfolds,' said one of the managers, opening the door and handing the children three pieces of black cloth. 
The Baudelaire suspected he was earnest as he hadn't bothered to say hello. Blindfolds? Violet asked. Everyone wears blindfolds at a high court trial, the manager replied. Except the judges, of course. Haven't you heard the expression, justice is blind? Yes, Klaus said, but I always thought it meant that justice should be fair and unprejudiced. The verdict of the high court was to take the expression literally, said the manager, so everyone except the judges must cover their eyes before the trial can begin. Scalia, Sonny said. She meant something like, it doesn't seem like the literal interpretation makes any sense, but her siblings did not think it was wise to translate. I also brought you some tea, he said, revealing a tray containing a teapot and three cups. I thought it might fortify you for the trial. By fortify, the manager meant that a few sips of tea might give the children some much-needed strength for their ordeal, and the children thought it must be Frank who was doing them such a favor. You're very kind, Violet said. I'm sorry there's no sugar, he said. That's quite all right, Klaus said, and then hurriedly flipped to a page in his commonplace book until he found his notes on the children's conversation with Kit Snicket. Tea should be bitter as wormwood, he read, and as sharp as a two-edged sword. The manager gave Klaus a small, unfathomable smile. Drink your tea, he said. I'll knock in a few minutes to bring you to trial. Frank, unless it was earnest, shut the door and left the Baudelaire's alone. Why did you say that about the tea? Violet asked. Well, I thought he might be talking to us in code, Klaus said. I thought if we gave the proper reply, something might happen. Unfathomable, Sonny said. Everything seems unfathomable, Violet said with a sigh, pouring tea for her siblings. It's getting so I can't tell a noble person from a wicked one. Kit said that the only way to tell a villain from a volunteer is to observe everyone and make such judgments ourselves, Klaus said. But that hasn't helped us at all. Today the High Court will do the judging for us, Violet said. Maybe they'll prove to be helpful. Or fail us, Sonny said. The eldest Baudelaire smiled and reached to help her sister put on her shoes. I wish our parents could see how much you've grown, she said. Mother always said that as soon as you learn to walk, Sonny, you'd be going places. I doubt a closet in the Hotel de Noumont was what she had in mind, Klaus said, blowing on his tea to cool it. Who knows what they had in mind? Violet asked, that's one more mystery we'll never probably be able to solve. Sonny took a sip of tea, which was indeed as bitter as wormwood and as sharp as a two-edged sword. Although the youngest Baudelaire had little experience with metallic weapons or hoary aromatic plants of the composite family, used in certain recreational tonics. Mama and Papa, she said hesitantly, and poison darts? Her siblings did not have time to answer as there was another knock on the door. Finish your tea, called either Frank or Ernest, and put on your blindfolds, the trial's about to begin. The Baudelaire's hurried to follow the instructions of either the volunteer or the villain and took a few quick sips of their tea, tied their shoes, and wound the pieces of cloth around their eyes. In a moment, they heard the door of one t room 121 open and heard Frank or Ernest step toward them. Where are you? he asked. We're right here. Violet said, can't you see us? Well, of course not, the manager replied. I'm also wearing a blindfold. Reach for my hand and I'll lead you to the trial. The eldest Baudelaire reached out in front of her and found a large, rough hand awaiting hers. Klaus took Violet's other hand and Sonny took Klaus's and in this way the children were led out of room 121. The expression blind leading the blind is the, like the expression justice is blind, is usually not taken literally as it simply refers to a confusing situation in which the people in charge know nothing more than the people following them. But, as the Baudelaire's learned, as they were led through the lobby, the blindfolded leading the blindfolded results in the same sort of confusion. The children could not see anything through their blindfolds, but the room was filled with the sounds of people looking for their companions, bumping up against one another and running into the walls and furniture. Violet was poked in the eye by someone's chubby finger, Klaus was mistaken for someone named Jerry by a man who gave him an enormous hug before learning of his mistake. 
and someone bumped into Sunny's head, assumed she was an ornamental vase, and tried to place an umbrella in her mouth. Above the noise of the crowd, the Baudelaire's heard the clock strike twelve insistent wrongs, and realized they had been sleeping quite some time. It was already Wednesday afternoon, which meant that Thursday, and the arrival of their noble friends and associates, was quite close indeed. Attention! The voice of Justice Strauss was also quite close indeed, and rang out over the crowd, along with the repeated banging of a gavel, a word which refers to the small hammer used by judges when they want someone's attention. Attention, everyone! The trial's about to begin. Everyone, please take your seats. How can we take our seats, a man asked, when we can't see them? Feel around with your hands, Justice Strauss said. Move to your right. Further, 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 for- Ow! Not that far, the judge said. There, sit. Now the rest of you follow his lead. How can we do what he did, asked someone else, if we can't see him? Can we peek, asked another person. No peeking, Justice Strauss said sternly. Our system of justice isn't perfect, but it's the only one we have. I remind you that all three judges of the high court are bare-eyed, and if you peek, you will be guilty of contempt of court. Contempt, by the way, is a word for finding something worthless or dishonorable. I know what the word contempt means, snarled a voice that the children could not recognize. I defined the word for the benefit of the Baudelaire's, Justice Strauss said, and the children nodded their thanks in the direction of the judge's voice, although all three siblings had known the meaning of contempt since a night long ago, when Uncle Monty had taken them to the movies. Baudelaire's, take three steps to your right. Three more. One more. There, there, you've reached your bench. Please sit down. The Baudelaire sat down on one of the lobby's wooden benches and listened to the footsteps of the manager as he left them alone and stumbled back into the settling crowd. Finally, it sounded as if everyone had found a seat of one kind or another, and with another few bangs of the gavel and calls for attention, the crowd quieted down and Justice Strauss began the trial. "'Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen,' she said, her voice coming from right in front of the Baudelaire's. "'And anyone else who happens to be in attendance. It has come to the attention of the High Court that certain wicked deeds have gone unpunished, and that this wickedness is continuing at an alarming rate.' We plan to hold a trial on Thursday, but after the death of Mr. Denouement, it is clear we should proceed earlier, in the interests of justice and nobility. We will hear what each witness has to say and determine once and for all who is responsible. The guilty parties will be turned over to the authorities who are waiting outside, making sure that no one will try to escape while the trial is in progress. And speaking of guilty parties, Count Olaf added, when the trial is over, everyone is invited to a very in cocktail party hosted by me. Wealthy women are particularly welcome. I'm hosting it, snarled the voice of Esme Squalor, and fashionable men will be given a free gift. All gifts are free, said either Frank or Ernest. You're out of order, Justice Strauss said sternly, banging her gavel. We are discussing social justice, not social engagements. Now then, will the accused parties please stand and state their names and occupations for the record? The Baudelaire stood up hesitantly. You too, Count Olaf, Justice Strauss said firmly. The wooden bench crackled beside the Baudelaire's and they realized the notorious villain had been also sitting on the bench and was now standing beside them. Name? the judge asked. Count Olaf? Count Olaf replied. Occupation? Impresario, he said, using a fancy word for someone who puts on theatrical spectacles. And are you innocent or guilty? asked Justice Strauss. The children thought they could hear Olaf's filthy teeth slide against his lips as he smiled. I'm unspeakably innocent, he said, and murmuring spread through the crowd like a ripple on the surface of a pond. You may be seated, Justice Strauss said, banging her gavel. Children, you are next. Please state your names. Violet Baudelaire, said Violet Baudelaire. Klaus Baudelaire, said Klaus Baudelaire. Sunny Baudelaire, said Sunny Baudelaire. The children heard the scratching of a pen and realized the judge was writing down everything that was being said. Occupations? The Baudelaires did not know how to answer this question. The word occupation, as I'm sure you know, usually refers to a job, but the Baudelaire's employment was sporadic a word which here means consisting of a great number of occupations held for a short time and under very unusual circumstances. The word can also refer to how one spends one's time, but the siblings hardly like to think of all 
the dreadful things that had occupied them recently. Lastly, the word occupation can refer to the state one is in, such as being a woman's husband or a child's guardian, but the youngsters were not certain how such a term could apply to the bewildering history of their lives. The Baudelaire's thought and thought and finally gave each an answer as they saw fit. Volunteer, Violet said. Concierge, Klaus said. Child, Sonny said. I object, Olaf said beside them. Their proper occupation is orphan or inheritor of a large fortune. Your objection is noted, Justice Strauss said firmly. Now then, Baudelaire's, are you guilty or innocent? Once again, the Baudelaire's hesitated before answering. Justice Strauss had not asked the children precisely what they were innocent or guilty of, and the expectant hush of the lobby did not make them want to ask the judge to clarify her question. In general, of course, the Baudelaire children believed themselves to be innocent, although they were certainly guilty, as we all are, of certain deeds that are, not any, that are anything but noble. But the Baudelaire's were not standing in general. They were standing next to Count Olaf. It was Klaus who found the words to compare the siblings' innocence and guilt with the innocence and guilt of a man who said he was unspeakably innocent. And after a pause, the middle Baudelaire answered the judge's question. We're comparatively innocent, he said, and a ripple went through the crowd again. The children heard the scratching of Justice Strauss's pen again, and the sound of Geraldine Julian's enthusiastic voice. I can see the headlines now, she cried. Everybody is innocent. Wait until the readers of the Daily Punctilio see that. Nobody is innocent, Justice Strauss said, banging her gavel. At least not yet. Now then, all those in the courtroom who have evidence they would like to submit to the court, please approach the judges and do so. The room erupted into pandemonium, a word which here means a crowd of blindfolded people attempting to give evidence to three judges. The Baudelaire sat on the bench and heard people stumbling over one another as they all tried to submit their research to the high court. I submit these newspaper articles, announced the voice of Geraldine Julian. I submit these employment records, announced Sir. I submit these environmental studies, announced Charles. I submit these grid books, announced Mr. Remora. I submit these blueprints of banks, announced Mrs. Bass. I submit these administrative records, announced Vice Principal Nero. I submit this paperwork, announced Hal. I submit these financial records, announced Mr. Poe. I submit these rule books, announced Mr. Lesko. I submit these constitutions, announced Mrs. Morrow. I submit these carnival posters, announced Hugo. I submit these anatomical drawings, announced Colette. I submit these books, announced Kevin, with both my left and right hands. I submit these ruby encrusted blank pages, announced Esme Squalor. I submit this book about how wonderful I am, announced Carmelita Spatz. I submit this commonplace book, announced either Frank or Ernest. So do I, announced either Frank or Ernest. I submit my mother. This last voice was the first in a parade of voices that the Baudelaire's could not recognize. It seemed that everyone in the lobby had something to submit to the high court, and the Baudelaire's felt as if they were in the middle of an avalanche of observations, research, and other evidence some of which sounded esculp esculpatory, a word which here means likely to prove that the Baudelaire's were innocent, and some which sounded damning, a word which made the children shudder just to think of it. I submit these photographs. I submit these hospital records. I submit these magazine articles. I submit these telegrams. I submit these couplets. I submit these maps. I submit these cookbooks. I submit these scraps of paper. I submit these screenplays. I submit these rhyming dictionaries. I submit these love letters. I submit these opera synopses. I submit these thesauri. I submit these marriage licenses. I submit these Talmudic commentaries. I submit these wills and testaments. I submit these auction catalogs. I submit these code books. I submit these mycological encyclopedias. I submit these menus. I submit the fairy schedules. I submit these theatrical programs. I submit these business cards. I submit these memos. I submit these novels. I submit these cookies. I submit these assorted pieces of evidence I am unwilling to categorize. Finally, the Baudelaire's heard a mighty thump and the triumphant voice of Jerome Squalor. 
I submit this comprehensive history of injustice, he announced, and the lobby filled with the sound of applause and of hissing as the volunteers and villains reacted. Justice Strauss had to bang her gavel quite a few times before the crowd settled down. Before the high court reviews this evidence, the judge said, we ask each accused person to give a statement explaining their actions. You can take as long as you want to tell your story, but you should leave out nothing important. Count Olaf, you may go first. The wooden bench crackled again as the villain stood up, and the Baudelaire's heard Count Olaf sigh and smelled his foul breath. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, I'm so incredibly innocent that the word innocent ought to be written on my face in capital letters. The letter I would stand for, I'm innocent. The letter N would stand for nothing wrong, which is what I've done. The letter A would stand for, that's not how you spell innocent, Justice Strauss interrupted. I don't think spelling counts, Count Olaf grumbled. Spelling counts, the judge said sternly. Well, innocence should be spelled O-L-A-F, Count Olaf said. And that's the end of my speech. The bench crackled as Olaf sat down. That's all you have to say? Justice Strauss said, asked in surprise. Yep, Count Olaf said. I told you not to leave out anything important, the judge reminded him. I'm the only important thing, Count Olaf insisted and I'm very innocent. I'm sure there's more in that enormous pile of evidence that proves me innocent than there is that proves me guilty. Well, all right, the judge said uncertainly. Baudelaire's, you may now tell us your side of the story. The Baudelaire stood up unsteadily, their legs trembling in nervous anticipation, but once again, they did not know quite what to say. Go on, Justice Strauss said kindly. We're listening. The Baudelaire orphans clasped hands. Although they had just been notified about the trial a few hours ago, the children felt as if they had been waiting forever to stand and tell their story to anyone who might listen. Although much of their story had been told to Mr. Poe and noted in Klaus's commonplace book, and discussed with the Quagmire triplets and other noble people they had met during their travels, they had never had the opportunity to tell their entire tale, from the dreadful day at Briny Beach when Mr. Poe gave them the terrible news about their parents, to this very afternoon, as they stood at the high court hoping that all of the villains in their lives would at last be brought to justice. Perhaps there had never been enough time to sit and tell their story just as they wanted to tell it, or perhaps their story was so unhappy that they dared not share all of the wretched details with anyone, or perhaps the Baudelaire's had simply not encountered anyone who listened to them as well as their parents had. As the siblings stood before the high court, they could picture the faces of their mother and father and the expressions they wore when listening to their children. Occasionally, one of the Baudelaire's would be telling their parents a story, and there would be an interruption of some kind. The ringing of the phone, or the loud noise of a siren outside, or even a remark from one of the other siblings. Hush, the Baudelaire parents would say to the interruption. It's not your day in court, they would say and then they would turn back to the Baudelaire who was talking and give them a nod to indicate the story should continue. The children stood together as the wooden bench creaked behind them and started to tell the story of their lives, a story they had waited their lives to tell. Well, Violet said, one afternoon my siblings and I were at Briny Beach. I was dreaming up an invention that could retrieve a rock after you skipped it into the ocean. Klaus was examining creatures in tide pools, and Sonny noticed that Mr. Poe was walking toward us. Hmm, Justice Strauss said, but it wasn't a thoughtful kind of hmm. Jo Violet thought perhaps the judge was saying hmm the way she had said hmm to either Frank or Ernest, as a safe answer. Go on, said a low, deep voice that belonged to one of the other judges. Justice Strauss was merely being thoughtful. Mr. Poe told us that there had been a terrible fire, Klaus continued. Our home was destroyed, and our parents were gone. Hmm. Just as Strauss said again, but it wasn't a sympathetic kind of hmm. Klaus thought perhaps that the judge was taking a sip of tea to fortify herself as the siblings told their story. Please continue, said another voice. This one was very hoarse, as if the third judge had been screaming for hours and could hardly talk. Just as Strauss was merely being sympathetic. Bildungsroman, said Sonny. She meant something along the lines of, 
Since that moment, our story has been a long, dreadful education in the wicked ways of the world and the mysterious secrets hidden in all of its corners. But before her siblings could translate, Justice Strauss uttered another hmm, and this one was the strangest of all. It did not sound like a safe answer. It was not a thoughtful hmm, and it certainly wasn't sympathetic or the noise someone might make while taking a sip of tea. To Sunny, the hmm sounded like a noise she'd heard a long time ago, not long after the day on Briny Beach the children were describing. The youngest Baudelaire had heard that same noise coming from her own mouth when she was dangling outside Count Olaf's tower room in a birdcage with a piece of tape covering her mouth. Sunny gasped, recognizing the sound just as Klaus recognized the voice of the second judge and Violet recognized the sound of the third. Blindly, the Baudelaire's reached out their hands to clutch one another in panic. "'What shall we do?' Violet whispered as quietly as possible. "'Peek!' Sunny whispered back. "'If we peek,' Klaus whispered, "'we'll be guilty of contempt of court.' "'What are you waiting for, orphans?' asked the low, deep voice. "'Yes,' said the hoarse one. "'Continue your story.' But the Baudelaire orphans knew they could not continue their story, no matter how long they had been waiting to tell it. At the sound of these familiar voices, they had no choice but to remove their blindfolds. The children did not care if they were guilty of contempt of court because they knew that if the other two judges were who they thought they were, then the high court was indeed something they found worthless or dishonorable, and so without any further discussion, they unwound the pieces of black cloth that covered their eyes, and the Baudelaire orphans peeked. It was a shop shocking and upsetting peek that awaited the Baudelaire's. Squinting in the sudden light, they peeked straight ahead where the voices of Justice Strauss and the other judges had come from. The children found themselves peeking at the concierge desk, which was piled with all the evidence the crowd had submitted, including newspaper articles, employment records, environmental studies, grade books, blueprints of banks, administrative records, paperwork, financial records, rule books, constitutions, carnival posters, anatomical drawings, books, ruby-encrusted blank pages, a book alleging how wonderful Carmelita Spatz was, commonplace books, photographs, hospital records, magazine articles, telegrams, couplets, maps, cookbooks, scraps of paper, screenplays, rhyming dictionaries, love letters, opera synopses, thesauri, marriage licenses, Talmudic commentaries, wills and testaments, auction catalogs, code books, mycological encyclopedias, menus, fairy schedules, theatrical programs, business cards, memos, novels, cookies, assorted pieces of evidence a certain person was unwilling to categorize, and someone's mother, all of which Dewey Denouement had been hoping to catalog. Missing from the desk, however, was Justice Strauss. And as the Baudelaire's peeked around the lobby, they saw that another person was missing too, for there was no one on the wooden bench, only a few etched rings from people wicked enough to set down glasses without using coasters. Frantically, they peeked through the blindfold crowd, blindfolded crowd that was waiting impatiently for them to continue their story. And finally, they spotted Count Olaf at the far side of the room. Justice Strauss was there too, tucked in the crook of Olaf's arm, the way you might carry an umbrella if both your hands were full. Neither of Count Olaf's filthy hands were full, but they were both otherwise engaged, a phrase which here means that one hand was covering Justice Strauss, Justice Strauss's mouth with tape, so she could only say, hmm, and the other was hurriedly pressing the button requesting an elevator. The harpoon gun, with its last hook gleaming wickedly, was leaning against the wall within easy reach of the treacherous villain. All this was a shocking and upsetting peak, of course, but even more shocking and upsetting was what the children saw when they returned their gaze to the concierge desk. For sitting at either end with their elbows on the pile of evidence were two villains at whom the children had hoped very much they would never get a peek at again. Villains of such wickedness that it is far too shocking and upsetting for me to write down their names. I can only describe them as the man with a beard but no hair and the woman with hair but no beard. But to the Baudelaire orphans, these two villainous judges were another peek at the wicked way of the world. That's the end of chapter 11. Let me catch up. Oh, welcome back, Moocher, if you're still here. And hi, Mystic. Hello, Pindrak. Thank you so much for the follow. Whenever I find a read aloud streamer, I feel like I'm an entomologist who discovered a new type of butterfly. Except read aloud streamers are rarer. Ah, well, I do do book streams, um, among other streams. I don't do only those, but I appreciate that follow. 
And thank you for the claps, Tara. I hope you're doing well this morning as well. Totally understand not wanting to interrupt the flow and only chatting between. Yeah, especially because I archive these onto YouTube for later. Um, and people typically don't want... They usually read along, and so I try to minimize interruptions. Thank you for that host! I'm just taking a few sips of my peppermint tea before I jump into chapter 12. We just have chapters 12 and 13 before we're done with this book. The translucent, yeah, for some reason my blue cup is reflecting my green screen, and so it's becoming see-through. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Shall we move along? Chapter 12. The man with a beard but no hair stood up from the concierge desk, his knees bumping against the little bells that had sent the Baudelaire orphans on their errands. The woman with hair but no beard pointed a finger at the three children that looked as crooked as she was. The finger had been broken long ago, in a dispute over a game of backgammon, which is another story that would take at least 13 books to describe, but in the Baudelaire's story the finger only made this brief appearance as it pointed at the children in alarm. The Baudelaire's have taken off their blindfolds, cried the villainous woman in her low, deep voice. Yes, agreed the villainous man in his hoarse voice. They're guilty of contempt of court. We certainly are, Violet agreed fiercely. This court is worthless and dishonorable. Two of the judges are notorious villains, Klaus announced over the gasps of the crowd. Peek, Sonny cried. No, nobody peek, ordered the man with a beard but no hair. Anybody who peeks will be turned over to the authorities. Take off your blindfolds, Violet begged the crowd. Count Olaf is kidnapping Justice Strauss this very moment. Hmm, cried Justice Strauss in agreement from behind the tape. Justice Strauss is enjoying a piece of saltwater taffy, the woman with hair but no beard said quickly. That's why she's talking in hmms. She's not enjoying anything, Klaus cried. If there are any volunteers in the crowd, take off your blindfolds and help us. The children are trying to trick you, said the man with a beard but no hair. Keep your blindfolds on. Yes, cried the woman with hair but no beard. They're trying to get all noble people arrested by the authorities. Real McCoy, Sonny yelled. I think the children might be telling the truth, Jerome Squalor said hesitantly. Those brats are liars, Esme snapped. They're worse than my ex-boyfriend. I believe them. Charles said, scratching at his blindfold. They've experienced villainy before. I don't, Sir announced. The children could not tell if he was wearing a blindfold underneath the cloud of smoke that still hung over his head. They're nothing but trouble. They're telling the truth, cried Frank, probably, unless it was Ernest. They're lying, cried Ernest, more, most likely, although I suppose it could have been Frank. They're good students, said Mr. Remora. They're lousy administrative assistants, said Vice Principal Nero. They're bank robbers, said Mrs. Bass, whose blindfold was covering her small, narrow mask. Bank robbers? Mr. Poe asked. Egad, who said that? They're guilty, cried the man with a beard but no hair, although the high court wasn't supposed to reach a verdict until all the evidence had been examined. They're innocent, cried Hal. They're freaks, screamed Hugo. They're twisted, shrieked Colette. They're right-handed, yelled Ke Kevin. They're headlines, screeched Geraldine Julian. They're escaping, said the woman with hair but no beard, and this at least was a true statement. Violet, Klaus, and Sonny realized that the crowd was going to do nothing that would stop Count Olaf from dragging Justice Strauss away from the trial, and that the people in the lobby would fail them, as so many noble people had failed them before. As the volunteers and villains argued around them, the children made their way quickly and stealthily away from the bench and toward Justice Strauss and Count Olaf, who was picking up the harpoon gun. If you've ever wanted one more cookie than people said you could have, then you know how difficult it is to move quickly and stealthily at the same time. 
But if you've had as much experience as the Baudelaire's in dodging the activities of people who were shouting at you, then you know that with enough practice, you can move quickly and stealthily just about anywhere, including across an enormous domed lobby while a crowd calls for your capture. We must capture them, called a voice in the crowd. It'll take a village to capture the Baudelaire's, shrieked Mrs. Morrow. We can't see them through our blindfolds. We don't want to be guilty of contempt of court, yelled Mr. Lesko. Let's feel our way through the hotel entrance so they can can't escape. The authorities are guarding the entrance, the man with a beard but no hair reminded the crowd. The Baudelaire's are running toward the elevators. Capture them. But don't be... But don't capture anyone else who happens to be standing near the elevators, added the woman with hair but no beard, looking hurriedly at Olaf. The sliding doors of an elevator began to open, and the Baudelaire's moved as quickly and stealthily as they could through the crowd who were reaching out blindly in all directions. Search the entire hotel, said the villainous man, and bring us anyone who you find suspicious. We'll tell you if they're villains or not, said the villainous woman. After all, you can't make such judgments yourself. Wrong... The enormous clock of the Hotel de Numa, the stuff of legend, announced one o'clock, thundering through the room of the blindfolded leading the blindfolded, just as the three siblings reached the elevators. Count Olaf had already dragged Justice Strauss inside and was hurriedly pressing the button that closes the elevator doors, but Sunny stuck out one of her feet and held them open, which is something only very brave people attempt. Olaf leaned forward to whisper threateningly at the Baudelaire's. Let me go, he whispered threateningly, or I'll announce to everyone where you are. Olaf, however, was not the only person who could whisper threateningly. Let us in, Violet whispered threateningly, or we'll announce to everyone where you are. Hmm, just as Strauss said. Count Olaf glared at the children, and the children glared back until at last the villain stepped aside and let the Baudelaire's join him and his prisoner in the elevator. Going down, he asked, and the children blinked. They had been so intent on escaping the crowd and reaching the judge that they hadn't considered exactly where they might go afterward. We're going wherever you go, Klaus said. I have a few errands to run, Olaf said. Ha! First, I'm going down to the basement to retrieve the sugar bowl. Ha! Then I'm going up to the roof to re retrieve the medusoid mycelium. Ha! Then I'm going down to the lobby to expose the fungus to everyone in the lobby. Ha! And then finally, I'm going up to the roof to escape without being seen by the authorities. You'll fail, Sonny said, and Olaf glared down at the youngest Baudelaire. Your mother told me the same thing, he said. <laughs> but one day when I was seven years old, the elevator's doors the elevator's doors slid open as it arrived at the basement, and the villain interrupted himself and quickly dragged Justice Strauss out into the hallway. Follow me, he called back to the Baudelaire's. The children, of course, did not want to follow this horrid man any more than they wanted to put cream cheese in their hair, but they looked at one another and could not think of what else they could do. You can't retrieve the sugar bowl, Violet said. You'll never open the vernacularly fastened door. Can't I? Olaf said, stopping at room 025. The lock was still stretched securely across the door as it had been when Sunny left it. This hotel is like an enormous library, the villain said. But you can find any item in a library if you have one thing. Catalog? Sunny asked. No, Count Olaf replied and pointed the harpoon gun at the judge. A hostage. With that, he turned to Justice Strauss and ripped the tape off her mouth very slowly so it would sting as much as possible. You're going to help me open this lock, he informed her with a wicked smile. I will do nothing of the sort, Justice Strauss replied. The Baudelaire's will help me drag you back up to the lobby where justice can be served. Justice is, isn't being served in the lobby, Olaf growled, or anywhere else in the world. Don't be so sure of that, Justice Strauss said and reached behind her back. The Baudelaire's looked hopefully at what she was holding, but their hopes fell when they saw it, what it was. Odious lusting after finance, she read out loud, holding up Jerome Squalor's comprehensive history of injustice. There's enough evidence in here to put you in jail for the rest of your life. Justice Strauss, Violet said, your fellow judges on the high court are associates of Count Olaf. Those villains will never put Olaf in jail. It can't be, Justice Strauss gasped. I've known them for years. I've told them everything that was happening to you children, and they were always very interested. Of course they were interested, you fool, Count Olaf said. They passed along all that information to me so I could catch up with the orphans. You've been helping me all along without even knowing it. Ha! Justice Strauss leaned against an ornamental vase. 
and her eyes filled with tears. I failed you again, Baudelaire's, she said. No matter how I've tried to help you, I've only put you in more danger. I thought justice would be served if you told the High Court your story, but no one's interested in their story, Count Olaf said scornfully. Even if you wrote down every last detail, no one would read such a dreadful thing. I've triumphed over the orphans and over every other no person foolish or noble enough to stand in my way. It's the unraveling of my story, or as the French say, the noblesse oblige. Denouement, Sonny corrected, but Olaf acted as though he had not heard and turned his attention to the lock on the door. That idiot sub sub said the first phrase is a description of a medical condition that all three Baudelaire children share, he muttered and turned to Justice Strauss. Tell me what it is or prepare to eat harpoon. Never, Justice Strauss said. I may have failed these children, but I will not fail VFD. You'll never get the sugar bowl no matter what terrible threats you make. I'll tell you what the first phrase is, Klaus said calmly, and his siblings looked at him in astonishment. Justice Strauss looked at him in amazement. Even Count Olaf seemed a little puzzled. You will? he asked. Certainly, Klaus said. It's just like you said, Count Olaf. Every noble person has failed us, so why should we protect the sugar bowl? Klaus! Sonny and Violet cried in simultaneous astonishment. No! Justice Strauss cried in solitary amazement. Count Olaf looked a little puzzled again, but then shrugged his dusty shoulders. Okay, he said. Tell me what medical condition you and your orphan siblings share. We're allergic to peppermints, Klaus said, and quickly typed A-L-L-E-R-G-I-C-T-O-P-E-P-P-E-R-M-I-N-T-S into the lock. Immediately, there was a muted clicking sound from the typewriter keyboard. It's warming up, Count Olaf said in a delighted wheeze. Get out of the way, four eyes! The second phrase is the weapon that left me an orphan, and I can type that one in myself. P-O-Y-Z- Wait! Klaus said before Olaf could touch the keyboard. That can't be right. Those letters don't spell anything. Spelling doesn't count, said the count. Yes, it does, Klaus said. Tell me what the weapon is that left you an orphan and I'll type it in for you. Count Olaf gave Klaus a slow smile that made the Baudelaire shudder. Certainly, I'll tell you. It was poison darts. Klaus looked at his sisters and then in grim silence typed P O. I-S-O-N-D-A-R-T-S -S, into the lock, which began to buzz quietly. Count Olaf's eyes shone brightly as he stared at the wires of the lock, which began to shake as they stretched around the hinges of the laundry room door. It's working, he said and ran his tongue over his filthy teeth. The sugar bowl is so close, I can taste it. Klaus took his commonplace book from his pocket and read his notes instantly, intently for a moment. Then he turned to Justice Strauss. Give me that book, please, he said, pointing to Jerome Squaller's book. The third phrase is the famous unfathomable question in the best-known novel by Richard Wright. Richard Wright was an American novelist in the, of the realist school whose writings illuminated the disparities in race relations. It is likely his work is quoted in the comprehensive history of injustice. You can't read that entire book, Count Olaf said. The crowd will find us before you finish the last chapter. I'll look in the index. Klaus said, just like I did at Aunt Josephine's when we decoded her note and found her hiding place. I always wondered how you did that, Olaf said, sounding almost as if he admired the middle Baudelaire's research skills. Klaus paged to the back of the book, where the index can usually be found. An index, as I'm sure you know, is a list of everything a book contains and where each item can be found. Right, Richard, Klaus read aloud. Unfathomable question in Native Son, page 581. That's the 581st page, Count Olaf explained for no one's benefit, a phrase which here means even though that was clear to everyone in the hallway. Klaus flipped hurriedly to the proper page and scanned it quickly, his eyes blinking behind his glasses. I found it, he said quietly. It's quite an interesting question, actually. No one cares about interesting questions, Olaf said. Type it in this instant. Klaus smiled and began typing furiously into the typewriter keyboard. His sisters stepped forward, and each of them put a hand on their brother's shoulder. "'Why do this?' Sonny asked. "'Sonny's right,' Violet said. "'Why are you helping Olaf get into the laundry room?' The middle Baudelaire typed the last word into the keyboard, which was T-O-P-P-L-I-N-G, and then looked at his sisters. "'Because the sugar bowl isn't there,' he said, and pushed open the door. 
What do you mean? Count Olaf demanded. Of course the sugar bowl's in there. I'm afraid Olaf is right, Justice Strauss said. You heard what Dewey said. When the crows were shot with the harpoon gun, they fell in onto the bird paper and dropped the sugar bowl into the funnel. So it would appear, Klaus said slyly. Enough nonsense, Count Olaf shouted, waving his harpoon gun in the air and stomping into the laundry room. In just a few moments, however, it was clear that the middle Baudelaire had spoken the truth. The laundry room of the Hotel de Numa was very small, just large enough to hold a few washing and drying machines, some piles of dirty sheets, and a few plastic jugs of what were presumably some extremely flammable chemicals. Just as Dewey had said, a metal tube hung over one corner of the ceiling, allowing steam from the machines to float up the tube and outside, but there was no sign that a sugar bowl had fallen through the funnel and dropped out of the metal tube to the wooden floor of the laundry room. With a hoarse, angry roar, Count Olaf opened the doors of the washing and drying machines and slammed them closed, then picked up the piles of dirty sheets and sent them tumbling onto the floor. "'Where is it?' he snarled, drops of spit flying from his furious mouth. "'Where's the sugar bowl?' "'It's a secret,' Klaus said, a secret that died with Dewey denouement." Count Olaf turned to face the Baudelaire orphans, who had never seen him look this frightening." His eyes had never gleamed as brightly, and his smile had never been as pectant, a word which here means so hungry for evil deeds as to be unhealthy. It was not unlike the face of Dewey had been, as he sank into the water, as if the villain's own wickedness was causing him great pain. He won't be the only volunteer who dies today, he said in a terrible whisper. I will destroy every soul in this hotel, Sugar bowl or no sugar bowl. I'll unleash the medusoid mycelium and volunteers and villains alike will perish in agony. My comrades have failed me as often as my enemies and I am eager to be rid of them. Then I'll push that boat off the roof and sail away with... You can't push that boat off the roof, Violet said. It would never survive the fall due to the force of gravity. Then I suppose I'll have to add the force of gravity to my list of enemies. Olaf muttered. I'll get that boat off the roof, Violet said calmly, and her siblings looked at her in astonishment. Justice Strauss looked at her in amazement. Even Count Olaf seemed a little puzzled. You will? he asked. Certainly, Violet said. It's just like you said, Count Olaf. Every noble person has failed us. Why shouldn't we help you escape? Violet! Klaus and Sonny cried in simultaneous astonishment. No! Justice Strauss cried in solitary amazement. Count Olaf still looked puzzled, but gave the eldest Baudelaire a shrug. Okay, he said. What do you need? A few of those dirty sheets, Violet said. I'll tie them together and make a drag chute, like I did in the Mortmain Mountains when I stopped the caravan from falling off the mountain. I always wondered how you did that, Olaf said, looking at the eldest Baudelaire as if he respected her inventing skills. Violet walked into the laundry room and gathered some sheets into her arms, trying to choose the least dirty of the bunch. Let's go to the roof, she said quietly. Her siblings stepped forward and each of them put a hand on their sister's shoulder. Why do this? Sonny asked. Sonny's right, Klaus asked. Why are you helping Olaf escape? The eldest Baudelaire looked at the sheets in her hand and then at her siblings. Because he'll take us with him, she said. Why would I do that? Olaf asked. Because you need more than one person crew, Violet said slyly, and we need to leave this hotel without being spotted by the authorities. I suppose that's true, Olaf said. Well, you would have ended up in my clutches in any case. Come along. Not yet, Sonny said. One more thing. Everyone stared at the youngest Baudelaire, who was wearing an expression so unfathomable that even her siblings could not tell what she was thinking. One more thing? Count Olaf repeated, staring down at Sonny. What could that be? The two eldest Baudelaires looked at their sister and felt a cold ripple in their stomachs, as if a stone had somehow been dropped straight into the siblings. It is very difficult to make one's way in this world without being wicked at one time or another, when the world's way is so wicked to begin with. When the unfathomable situations arose in the lives of the Baudelaire's and they did not know what to do, the children often felt as if they were balancing very delicately on top of something very fragile and very dangerous, and that if they weren't careful, they might fall a very long way into a sea of wickedness. Violet felt this delicate balance when she offered to help Count Olaf escape, even though it meant that she and her siblings could escape too. And Klaus felt this delicate balance when he helped Olaf unlock the laundry room door, even though the sugar bowl was not to be found inside. And of course, all three Baudelaire orphans felt this delicate balance when they thought about Dewey denouement, and that terrible instant when the weapon in their hands brought about his death. 
But as Sonny answered Count Olaf's question, the clock of the Hotel de Numont struck two wrongs, and her siblings wondered if they had lost their balance at last, and were tumbling away from all the noble people in the world. Burn down hotel, Sonny said, and all three Baudelaire orphans felt as if they were falling. The end of chapter 12. Thank you for shouting out Mystic, Paige, and Holland. I agree, the children are trying to trick everybody. Probably. Doesn't everyone want to put cream cheese in their hair? Of course they don't. That'd be weird. <laughs> Hat covering creamy hair. Everyone in the American court system says you're free to go, Olaf. Good morning, Disney. Thank you for shouting him out. Making some food and playing some Pokemans. That sounds fun. He already typed, po typed poise, so it's poi poison darts. I too am an, 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 wow. an enemy of the force of gravity. That was hard to say. Yeah. It would be really cool to like be able to fly. Just be like, whoosh, whoosh, you know, or whatever. M and C anemone. And then anemone. It's like in finding Nemo. I'm assuming that the music and stuff is okay. Anemone anemone. Cool, cool, thanks. Okay. One more chapter to go. Let's knock it out. <clears throat> I think this is cool, so I just want to show it. That it has, like, a reflection. I don't know if you can tell, but, like... This is the beginning, and then it's reflected. Like, this is water down here. It's some peppermint tea, actually. Tara actually watching a movie? Unbelievable. Tara watches lots of movies. He just doesn't watch good movies. <laughs> mm hmm <clears throat> okay. Chapter 13. Ha! Count Olaf crowed. This takes the cake. He was using an expression which here means, I find this especially amusing and outrageous. Although Dewey Denouement's underwater catalog contains a list of 27 cakes that Olaf has stolen. With a look of treacherous glee, he reached down and patted Sonny Baudelaire on the head, using the hand that wasn't clutching the harpoon gun. After all this time, the littlest orphan wants to follow in my footsteps, he cried. I knew I was a good guardian after all. You're not a good guardian, Violet said, and Sonny's not an arsonist. My sister doesn't know what she's saying. Burn down a hotel, Sonny insisted. Are you feeling all right, Sonny? Klaus asked, peering into his sister's eyes. He was worried that the medusoid mycelium, which had threatened the life of the youngest Baudelaire just days ago, was affecting her in some sinister way. Klaus had researched a way to dilute the treacherous fungus, but he wondered now if dilution was not enough. I feel fine, Sunny said. Burn down hotel. That's my girl, Count Olaf cried. I only wish Carmelita had your spunk. With all the errands I had to do, burning down this hotel hadn't even occurred to me. But even when you're very busy, you should always take some time for your hobbies. Your hobbies, Justice Strauss said, are nothing but villainy, Count Olaf. The Baudelaire's may want to join you in wickedness, but I'll do anything in my power to stop you. There's nothing in your power, Olaf sneered. Your fellow judges are comrades of mine. Your fellow volunteers are running around the lobby of this hotel wearing blindfolds, and I have the harpoon gun. I have a comprehensive history of injustice, Justice Strauss cried. 
This book should be good for something. The villain did not continue his argument, but merely pointed the weapon at the judge. You orphans will start the fire here in the laundry room, he said, while I make sure Justice Strauss doesn't stop us. Yes, sir, Sunny said and reached for her siblings' hands. No, Justice Strauss cried. Why are you doing this, Sunny? Violet asked her sister. You're going to hurt innocent people. Why are you helping Count Olaf burn down this building? Klaus cried. Sunny looked at the laundry room and then up at her siblings. In silence, she shook her head as if this was not the time to discuss such matters. Help me, she said, and she did not have to say anything more. Although Violet and Klaus found their sister's actions unfathomable, they followed her into the laundry room as Olaf uttered a succinct laugh of triumph. Ha! Count Olaf laughed. Pay attention, orphans, and I'll teach you some of my best tricks. First, spread those dirty sheets all over the floor. Then take those jugs of extremely flammable chemicals and pour them all over the sheets. In silence, Violet spread the rest of the sheets over the laundry room's wooden floor, while Klaus and Sunny walked over to the plastic jugs opened them, and spilled them all over the sheets. A strong, bitter smell wafted from the laundry room as the children turned to Olaf and asked what was next. What is next? Sunny asked. Next is a match and some kindling, Olaf replied and reached into his pocket with the hand that wasn't holding the gun. I always carry matches on my person, he said, just as my enemies always carry kindling. He leaned forward and snatched odious lusting after finance out of Justice Strauss's hands. This book is good for something, he said, and tossed it into the center of the dirty sheets, narrowly missing the siblings as they walked into the hallway. Jerome Squaller's book opened as it landed, and the children saw what looked like a carefully drawn diagram with arrows and dotted lines and a paragraph of notation underneath. The Baudelaire's leaned forward to see if they could read what the injustice expert had written and only caught the word passageway before Olaf lit a match and tossed it expertly onto the page. The paper caught on fire at once, and the brook began to burn. Oh, Sunny said quietly and leaned against her siblings. All three Baudelaire's and the adults standing with them stared into the laundry room in silence. The burning of a book is sad. A sad, sad sight, for even though a book is nothing but ink and paper, it feels as if the ideas contained in the book are disappearing as the pages turn to ashes and the cover and binding which is the term for the stitching and glue that holds the pages together, blacken and curl as the flames do their wicked work. When someone is burning a book, they are showing utter contempt for all of the thinking that produced its ideas, all of the labor that went into its words and sentences, and all of the trouble that befell the author, from the swarm of termites that tried to destroy his notes, to the large boulder that someone rolled onto the illustrator as he sat by the edge of the pond waiting for the delivery of the manuscript. Justice Strauss gazed at the book with a shocked frown, perhaps thinking of Jerome Squaller's research and all the villains it might have brought to justice. Count Olaf stared at the book with a smug smile, perhaps thinking of all of the other libraries he had destroyed. But you and I know there is no perhaps about what the Baudelaire orphans were thinking as they stared at the flames devouring the comprehensive history of injustice. Violet, Klaus, and Sunny were thinking of the fire that took their parents and their home and dropped them into the world to fend for themselves a phrase which here means go first from guardian to guardian and then from desperate situation to desperate situation, trying to survive and solve the mysteries that hung over their heads like smoke. The Baudelaire orphans were thinking of the first fire that had come into their lives and wondering if this one would be the last. We'd best get away from here, Count Olaf said, breaking the silence. In my experience, once the flames reach the chemicals, the fire will spread very quickly. I'm afraid the cocktail party will be canceled, but if we hurry, there's still time to infect the guests of this hotel with the medusoid mycelium before we escape. Ha! To the elevators. Twirling the harpoon gun in his hands, the villain strode down the hallway, dragging the judge as he went, and the Baudelaire's hurried to follow. When they reached the elevator, the children looked at a sign posted near one of the ornamental vases. The sign was identical to one posted in the lobby, and it is a sign you have probably seen yourself. In case of fire, it said in fancy script, Use stairs. Do not use elevator. Stairs, Sunny said, pointing at the sign. Ignore that, Olaf said scornfully, punching the button to summon the elevator. Dangerous, Sunny pointed out. Take the stairs. You may have had the idea to burn down the hotel, Count Olaf said, but I'm still the boss here, baby. We won't get the fungus in time if we take the stairs while taking the elevator. Drat, Sunny said quietly and frowned in thought. Violet and Klaus looked at their sister curiously, wondering why a child who didn't mind setting a fire 
a hotel on fire would be upset over something like an elevator. But then Sunny gazed up at her siblings with a sly smile and uttered one word that made everything clear. Preludio, she said, and after a moment her siblings grinned. What? Olaf's asked sharply and punched the button over and over again, which never helps. What my sister means, Violet said, is that she appreciates the lesson on setting fires. But that is not what the youngest Baudelaire meant at all. By Preludio, her siblings knew, Sunny was referring to the Hotel Preludio and the weekend vacation the entire Baudelaire family had spent there. As Kit Snicket had mentioned, the Hotel Preludio was a lovely place, and I am happy to report that it is still standing, like a small mercy, and that its ballroom still has its famous chandeliers, which are shaped like enormous jellyfish and move up and down in time to the music that the orchestra plays, and that the bookstore in the lobby still specializes in the work of American novelists of the Realist School, and the outdoor swimming pool is still as beautiful as it ever was, its reflection of the hotel windows shimmering whenever anyone dives in to swim laps. But the Baudelaire orphans were not remembering the chandeliers, or the bookstore, or even the swimming pool where Sonny first learned to blow bubbles. They were remembering a prank their father had taught them when he was in one of his whim whimsical moods that can be played in any elevator. The prank, a word which here means joke played on someone with whom you are sharing an elevator, is best played at the moment when you are about to get off the elevator and your fellow passengers are heading to a higher story. The Baudelaire's mother had objected to their father teaching them such a prank as she said it was undignified, but their father had pointed out it was no more undignified than doing magic tricks with dinner rolls, which their mother had done that very morning in the hotel restaurant, and she reluctantly agreed to participate in the prank. This particular moment in the Baudelaire's lives, of course, was not the best one for a prank, but Violet and Klaus saw immediately what their sister had in mind, and when the sliding doors opened and Count Olaf stomped inside the elevator, the three Baudelaire's followed him and immediately pressed every single button. When the Baudelaire's father had done this after exiting the elevator, it meant that re the remaining passenger, a tiresome woman named Eleonora, had been forced to visit every story on the way up to her room, but here in the Hotel de Numont, the prank served a dual purpose. A phrase which here means enabled the Baudelaire's to do two things at once. What are you doing? Olaf shrieked. I'll never reach the Medusa and Mycelium in time to poison everyone. We'll be able to warn as many people as possible that the building is on fire. Ju cried Justice Strauss. Dual purpose, Sunny said, and shared a small smile with her siblings as the elevator reached the lobby and opened its doors. The enormous domed room was nearly empty, and the Baudelaire's could see that everyone had followed the advice of the two wicked judges of the High Court and were wandering blindfolded around the hotel. Fire! cried Violet immediately, knowing the doors would slide shut in an instant. Attention, everyone! There is a fire in the hotel! Please leave at once! The man with a beard but no hair was standing nearby with his hand on Jerome Squalor's shoulder so he could push the injustice expert around. Fire? he said in his strange hoarse voice. Good work, Olaf. What do you mean good work? demanded Jerome, a, fr a frown appearing below his blindfold. I, I meant to say, uh, there's Olaf, the man said hurriedly, pushing Jerome in the direction of the elevator. Capture him. He needs to be brought to the authorities. Olaf is here? asked probably Frank, who was feeling his way along the wall with his brother. I'm going to capture him. Where are the Baudelaire's? demanded probably Ernest. I'm going to capture them. In the, in the elevator, shouted the woman with hair but no beard from across the lobby, but the sliding doors were already closing. Call the fire department, Violet cried desperately. Which one? was the reply, but the children could not tell if it came from Frank or Ernest, and the door slid shut on this one last glimpse of the villains and volunteers before the elevator ro began its rise to the second story. Those judges promised that if I waited until tomorrow, I'd see all my enemies destroyed, Count Olaf grumbled, and now they're trying to capture me. I knew they'd fail me some day. The Baudelaire's did not have time to point out that Olaf had also failed the judges by planning to poison them, along with everyone else in the lobby, with the medusoid mycelium, because the elevator immediately stopped on the second story and opened its doors. There's a fire in the hotel! Klaus called into the hallway. Everyone leave at once! A fire? said Esme Squalor. The Baudelaire's were surprised to see that this treacherous woman was still wearing her blindfold, but perhaps she had decided that pieces of black cloth were in. Who said that? It's Klaus Baudelaire, Klaus Baudelaire said. You need to get out of the hotel. Don't listen to that cake sniffer, cried Carmelita Spatz, who was running a hand over an ornamental vase. 
He's just trying to escape from us. Let's take off our blindfolds and peek. Don't take off your blindfolds, cried Count Olaf. Those Baudelaire's are guilty of contempt of court, and they're trying to trick you into joining them. There's no fire. Whatever you do, don't leave the hotel. We're not tricking you, Klaus said. Olaf is tricking you. Please believe us. I don't know who to believe, Esme said scornfully. You orphans are, di are as dishonest as my ex-boyfriend. Leave us alone, Carmelita ordered, bumping into a wall. We can find our own way. The door slid shut before the Baudelaire's could argue any further, and indeed the children never argued with either unpleasant female ever again. In a moment, the elevator arrived at the third story, and Sunny raised her voice so that she could be heard by anyone, treacherous or noble, in the hallway. Fire! she called. Use stairs! Do not use elevator! Sunny Baudelaire? M Mr. Poe called, recognizing the child's voice. The banker was facing the entirely wrong direction and holding a white handkerchief up to his black blindfold. Don't add the false reporting of fire to your list of crimes. You're already guilty of contempt of court and perhaps murder. It's not false, Justice Strauss exclaimed. There really is a fire, Mr. Poe. Leave this hotel. I can't leave, Mr. Poe replied, coughing into his handkerchief. I'm still in charge of the Baudelaire's affairs and their parents for... The elevator doors closed before Mr. Poe could finish his word, and the Baudelaire's were taken away from the banker one last time. And with each stop of the elevator, I'm sorry to say, it was more or less the same. The Baudelaire saw Mrs. Bass on the third story, still wearing her small blonde wig like the snow cap on the top of a mountain peak, and her blindfold stretched over her small, narrow mask. And they saw Mr. Ramora, who was wandering around the seventh story with Vice Principal Nero. They saw Geraldine Julienne, who was using her microphone the way some blind people use a cane, and they saw Charles and Sir, who were holding hands so as not to lose one another, and they saw Hugo and Colette and Kevin, who were holding the bird paper Klaus had hung outside the window of the sauna, and they saw Mr. Lesko arguing with Mrs. Morrow, and they saw a man with a guitar making friends with a woman in a crow-shaped hat, and they saw many people they did not recognize either as volunteers or villains, who were wandering the hallways of the hotel to capture anyone they may find suspicious. Some of these people believed the Baudelaire's when they told them the news of the fire, and some of these people believed Count Olaf when he told them the Baudelaire's were lying, and some of these people believed Justice Strauss when she told them that Count Olaf was lying when he said the Baudelaire's were lying when they told them that the news of the fire. But the elevator stop on each story of the hotel was very brief, and the children had only a glimpse of each of these people. They heard Mrs. Bass mutter something about a getaway car, and they heard Mr. Ramora wonder something about fried bananas. They heard Nero worry about his violin case and Geraldine squeal about headlines. And they heard Charles and Sir bicker over whether or not fires were good for the lumber industry. They heard Hugo ask if the plan for the hors d'oeuvres was still in operation. And they heard Colette ask about plucking the feathers off crows. And they heard Kevin complain that he didn't know whether to hold the bird paper in his right or left hand. And they heard Mr. Lesko insult Mrs. Morrow and the bearded man sing a song to the woman with the crow-shaped hat. And they heard a man call for Bruce, and a woman call for her mother, and dozens of people whisper to, and shout at, argue with, and agree upon, angrily accuse, and meekly defend, furiously compliment, and kindly insult dozens of other people, both inside and outside the Hotel de Numal, whose names the Baudelaire's recognized, forgot, and had never heard before. Each story had its story, and each story's story was unfathomable in the Baudelaire orphan's short journey. And many of the story's stories are unfathomable to me, even after all these lonely years and all this lonely research. Perhaps some of these stories are clearer to you, because you have spied upon the people involved. Perhaps Mrs. Bass has changed her name and lives near you. Or perhaps Mr. Ramora's name is the same and he lives far away. Perhaps Nero now works as a grocery store clerk, or Geraldine Julianne now teaches arts and crafts. Perhaps Sir and Charles are no longer partners and you have had the occasion to study one of them as he sat across you on a bus. Or perhaps Hugo, Colette, and Kevin are still comrades and you have followed these unfathomable people after noticing that one of them used both hands equally. Perhaps Mr. Lesko is now your neighbor or Mrs. Morrow is now your sister or your mother or your aunt or wife or even your husband. Perhaps the noise you hear outside your door is a bearded man trying to climb into your window. Or perhaps it is a woman in a crow-shaped hat hailing a taxi. Perhaps you have spotted the managers of the Hotel de Numal, or the judges of the High Court, or the waiters of Café Salmonella, or the Anxious Clown. Or perhaps you have met an expert on injustice or become one yourself. Perhaps the people in your unfathomable life, 
and their unfathomable stories are clear to you as you make your way in the world, but when the elevator stopped for the last time and the doors slid open to reveal the tilted roof of the Hotel de Numan, the Baudelaire's felt as if they were balancing very delicately on a mysterious and perplexing heap of unfathomable mysteries. They did not know who would survive the fire they helped set and who would perish. They did not know who they thought were volunteers and who they thought were villains, or who believed were innocent and who they believed were guilty. And they did not know if their own observations, errands, and deeds meant that they were noble or wicked or somewhere in between. As they stepped out of the elevator and walked across the rooftop sunbathing salon, the Baudelaire orphans felt as if their entire lives were like a book, filled with crucial information that had been set aflame, like the comprehensive history of injustice that was now just ashes in a fire, growing more enormous by the second. Look, cried Count Olaf, leaning over the edge of the hotel and pointing down. The Baudelaire's looked, expecting to see the enormous calm surface of the pond reflecting the Hotel de Numan back at them like an enormous mirror. But the air was stained with patches of thick black smoke that poured out of the basement windows as the fire began to spread, and the surface of the pond looked like a series of tiny mirrors, each broken into strange, unfathomable shapes. Here and there, among the smoke and mirrors, the children could see the tiny figures running this way and that, but they could not tell if they were the authorities on the ground or people in the hotel running to escape from the blaze. Olaf continued to gaze downward, and the Baudelaire's could not tell if he looked pleased or disappointed. "'Thanks to you, orphans,' he said. "'It's too late to destroy everyone with the medusoid mycelium, but at least we got to start a fire.' Just as Strauss was still gazing at the smoke pouring from the windows and rising into the sky, and her expression was equally unfathomable. "'Thanks to you, orphans,' she said quietly to the Baudelaire's. "'This hotel will be destroyed by fire, but at least we stopped Olaf from releasing the fungus.' "'The fire isn't burning very quickly,' Olaf said. "'Many people will escape.' "'The fire isn't burning slowly, either,' just as Strauss said. "'Some people won't.' The Baudelaire orphans looked at one another, but before anyone could say anything further, the entire building trembled, and the children had to struggle to keep their balance on the tilted roof. The shiny sunbathing mats tumbled across the salon, and the water in the swimming pool splashed against the side of the large wooden boat, dampening the figurehead of the octopus attacking a man in a diving suit. The fire's weakening the structural foundations of the building, Violet said. We have to get out of here, Klaus said. Pronto, Sonny said. Without another word, the Baudelaire's turned from the adults and strode quickly toward the boat. Shifting the pile of sheets into one hand, Violet took off her concierge hat, reached into her pocket, and found the ribbon Kit Snicket had given her, which she used to tie up her hair. Klaus reached into his pocket and found his commonplace book, which he began to flip through. Sunny did not reach into her pocket, but she scraped her sharp teeth together thoughtfully, as she suspected they might be needed. Violet stared critically at the boat. "'I'll attach the drag chute to the figurehead,' she said." I should be able to tie a devil's tongue knot around the helmet of the diver. She paused for a moment. That's where the medusoid mycelium's hidden, she said. Count Olaf kept it there where no one would think of looking. Klaus stared critically at his notes. I'll angle the sail to catch the wind, he said, otherwise a heavy object like this would fall straight down into the water. He paused for a moment, too. That's what happened to the sugar bowl, he said. Dewey Denouement let everyone think it fallen into the laundry room so no one would find it in the pond. Spatulas as oars... Sonny said, pointing to the implements that Hugo had used to flip over the sunbathers. Good idea, Violet agreed, and gazed out to the gray, troubled waters of the sea. Maybe our friends will find us. Hector should be flying this way with Kit Snicket and the Quagmires. And Fiona, Klaus added. No, Sonny said. What do you mean? Violet asked, stepping carefully from the edge of the pool onto the side of the boat, where she began to climb a rope ladder up to the figurehead. They said they would arrive by Thursday, Klaus said, helping Sonny climb aboard and then stepping onto the boat them himself. The deck was about the size of a large mattress, big enough to hold the Baudelaire's and perhaps one or two more passengers. It's Wednesday afternoon. The fire, Sonny said, and pointed at the smoke as it rose toward the sky. The two older Baudelaire's gasped. They'd almost forgotten that Kit had told them she would be watching the skies, looking for a signal that would cancel Thursday's gathering. That's why you thought of lighting the fire. Violet said, hurriedly tying the sheets around the figurehead. It's a signal. VFD will see it, Klaus said, and know that all their hopes have gone up in smoke. Sunny nodded. The last safe place, she said, is safe no more. 
It was an impressive sentence for the youngest Baudelaire, but a sad one. Maybe our friends will find us anyway, Violet said. They might be the last noble people we know. If they're truly noble, Klaus said, they might not want to be our friends. Violet nodded and her eyes filled with tears. You're right, she admitted. We killed a man. Accident, Sonny said firmly. And burned down a hotel, Klaus said. Signal, Sonny said. We had good reasons, Violet said, but we still did bad things. We want to be noble, Klaus said, but we've had to be treacherous. Noble enough, Sonny said, but the building trembled again, as if shaking its head in disagreement. Violet hung onto the figurehead, and Klaus and Sonny hung onto each other as the boat bumped against the sides of the swimming pool. Help us, Violet cried to the adults who were still staring at the rising smoke. Grab those spatulas and push the boat to the edge of the roof. Don't boss me around, Olaf growled, but he followed the judge to a corner of the roof where the spatulas lay, their mirrors reflecting the afternoon sun and the sky as it darkened with smoke. Each adult grabbed one spatula and poked at the boat the way you might poke at a spider you were trying to get out of your bathtub. Bump, bump. The sailboat bumped against the edge of the pool, then jostled its way out of the pool, where it slowly slid with a loud scraping sound to the far edge of the roof. The boatlers hung on tightly as the front half of the boat kept sliding across the mirrors of the salon until it was hanging over nothing but the smoky air. The boat tipped this way and that in a delicate balance between the roof of the hotel and the sea below. "'Climb aboard!' Violet cried, giving her knots one last tug. "'Of course I'll climb aboard,' Olaf announced, narrowing his eyes at the helmet of the figurehead. "'I'm the captain of this boat!' He threw his spatula onto the deck, narrowly missing Klaus and Sonny, then bounded onto the ship, making it teeter wildly on the edge of the building. "'You too, Justice Strauss,' Klaus called, but the judge just put down her spatula and looked sadly at the children. "'No,' she said, and the children could see she was crying. "'I won't go. It's not right.' "'What else can we do?' Sonny asked, but Justice Strauss just shook her head. "'I won't run from the scene of a crime,' she said. "'You children should come with me and we'll explain everything to the authorities.' They might not believe us, Violet said, readying the drag chute, or there might be enemies lurking in their ranks like the villains in the high court. Perhaps, the judge said, but that's no excuse for running away. Count Olaf gave his former neighbor a scornful look and then turned to the Baudelaire's. Let her burn to a crisp if she wants, he said, but it's time for us to go. Justice Strauss took a deep breath and then stepped forward and put her hand on the hideous wooden carving as if she meant to drag the whole boat back onto the hotel. There are people who say that criminal behavior is the destiny of children from a broken home, she said through her tears. Don't make this your destiny, Baudelaire. Klaus stood at the mast, adjusting the controls of the sail. This boat, he said, is the only home we have. I've been following you all this time, she said, her grip tightening on the figurehead. You've always just been out of my grasp from the moment Mr. Poe took you away from the theater in his car to the moment Kit Snicket took you through the hedges in her taxi. I won't let you go, Baudelaire's. Sunny stepped toward the judge, and for one moment her siblings thought she was going to step off the boat. But then she merely looked into the judge's weeping eyes and gave her a very sad smile. Goodbye, she said, and the Baudelaire opened her mouth and bit the hand of Justice. With a cry of pain and frustration, Justice Strauss let go of the figurehead, and the building trembled again, sending the judge tumbling to the ground and the boat tumbling off the roof just as the clock of the Hotel de Noumont announced the hour for the very last time. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The clock struck three times and the three Baudelaire's screamed as they hurtled toward the sea, and even Count Olaf crimed, cried, Mommy! as it seemed for a terrible moment that their luck had run out at last, and that the boat would not survive the fall due to the force of gravity. But then Violet let go of the dirty sheets, and the drag chute billowed into the air, looking almost like another patch of smoke against the sky, and Klaus moved the sail to catch the wind, and the boat stopped falling and started to glide, the way a bird will catch the wind and let its wings rest for a few mo moments, particularly if it is tired from carrying something heavy and important. For a moment, the boat floated down through the air like something in a magical story, and even in their panic and fear, the Baudelaire's could not help marveling at the way they were escaping. Finally, with a mighty splash... The boat landed in the ocean, quite a distance from the burning hotel. For another terrible moment, it felt like the boat was going to sink into the water, just as Dewey de Numont has sunk into the pond, 
guarding his underwater catalog and all its secrets, and leaving the woman he loved pregnant and distraught. But the sail caught the wind, and the figurehead righted itself, and Olaf picked up his spatula and handed it to Sonny. Start rowing, he ordered, and then began to cackle, his eyes shining bright. You're in my clutches at last, orphans, he said. We're all on the same boat. The Bodlers looked at the villain, and then looked at the shore. For a moment they were tempted to jump overboard and swim back toward the city and away from Olaf. But when they looked at the smoke pouring from the windows of the hotel, and the flames curling around the lilies and moss that someone had grown with such care on the walls, they knew it would just it would be just as dangerous on land. They could see the tiny figures of people standing outside the hotel, fiercely pointing toward the sea, and they saw the building tremble. It seemed that the Hotel de Numont would soon be sent toppling, and the children wanted to be far away. Dewey had promised them that they wouldn't be at sea anymore, but at this moment the sea for the Baudelaire's was the last safe place. Richard Wright, an American novelist of the realist school, asks a famous unfathomable question in his best-known novel, Native Son. Who knows when some slight shock, he asks, disturbing the delicate balance between social order and thirsty aspiration, shall send the skyscrapers in our cities toppling. It is a difficult question to read, almost as if it is in some sort of code, but after much research I have been able to make some sense of its mysterious words. Social order, for instance, is a phrase which may refer to the systems people use to organize their lives, such as the Dewey Decimal System or the blindfolded procedures of the High Court. And thirsty aspiration is a phrase which may refer to things people want, such as the Baudelaire Fortune or the Sugar Bowl or a safe place that lonely and exhausted orphans can call home. So when Mr. Wright asks his question, he might be wondering if a small event, such as a stone dropping into a pond, can cause ripples in the systems of the world and tremble the things that people want, until all this rippling and trembling brings down something enormous, such as a building. The Baudelaire's, of course, did not have a copy of Native Son on the wooden boat that served as their new home, but as they gazed across the water at the Hotel de Numont, they were asking themselves a question not unlike Mr. Wright's. Violet, Klaus, and Sonny wondered about all the things, large and small, that they had done. They wondered about their observations as flaneurs, which left so many mysteries unsolved. They wondered about all their errands as concierges, which brought about so much trouble. And they wondered if they were still the noble volunteers they wanted to be, or if, as the fire made its wicked way through the hotel, and the building threatened to topple, it was their destiny to become something else. The Baudelaire orphan stood in the same boat as Count Olaf, the notorious villain, and looked out at the sea where they hoped they could find their noble friends and wondered what else they could do and who they might become. It's the end of chapter 13 and the end of the book. Let me catch up. Also, two girls said they'd never talk to me again if I didn't watch Finding Nemo, so I just agreed. Joke's on them. I was way more of a pox on them after that than worthwhile. <laughs> what, some bad ones? Warnings, The Wicker Tree. Follow up to the equally bad Wicker Man that had nothing to do with Wicker Man. The incredibly strange creatures who stopped living and became mixed up zombies. Christmas presents. Dead detectives. Dude Bro Party Massacre 3, which had no previous entries. Troll 2, which had no Troll 1 officially connected to it. Wolf Cop, Lace Crater, and of course, Manos, The Hands of Fate. Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, and Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny. Oh, Disney left! Oh, gosh. I'd leave two about hearing about the incredibly strange creatures who stopped living and became mixed up zombies. <laughs> I did read the movie titles. I did appreciate them. I like, I like Dude Bro Party Massacre 3. False fires. Gosh, children. Just use both, Kevin. Just use both hands. Research is lonely? It can be. Perhaps I did a lot of things, Snicket. Joke's on you. did nothing. Starting fires is pretty cool is what you picked up. I'll add to my no notes too, Klaus. Don't worry. Starts writing. I am pretending to write something down. Way to be a downer, Sonny, with your safe place sentence. Kids, the sooner they learn to talk, the sooner they express miserable and depressing things. Might not. What makes you say that? The fact that a fair majority of the books have shown that some nobody listens to children and believes stupid things instead, like in an online community hating on something. Justice is a be dish best served cold. Hey, Heartless. 
Chef Batman. Oh, he loves serving justice. Thank you for shouting out, HS. I hopped in the stream and got spoiled about Justice Strauss coming back. I'm sorry. I appreciate you coming in to support, but you could have just waited till it was VOD and you watched them all in order. Finding Nemo's overrated. It's not one of my favorites. I still think it's good, but... Okay, real quick before we end stream, I want to read the preview for the next. Oh, if you guys want to see the book or the picture. Okay, this is all we get for a preview for the next book. To my kind editor, the end is near. With all due respect, Lemony Snicket. That's it. I agree with that. Um, all right, so that's it. We are done with book 12. The next book I will be reading on stream is going to be... Ne oh, look at all of the yellow and green on the cover going weird. The Secret of Shadow Ranch. Nancy drew The Secret of Shadow Ranch. That will be the next book I read on stream. And then when we're done with that, we will read book 13. The end of a series of unfortunate events. All right, guys. Well, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you for being here. Thank you to anybody who's watching this later. I hope you enjoyed that as well. I'm getting close to the end. Yeah, exactly. Um, secrets disappeared, Nancy. And Nancy's shirt's just gone. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Take care of yourselves until I see you again. I'm going to try to stream tomorrow, but I may also take the day off. Kind of tentative about that. So may or may not see you tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. As always, much love and bye-bye.